Hello and a very good evening to everyone. My name is Sean and you are on the Ren11 page. This live recording is being done on Friday the 24th of April. Um, so for those who are watching tonight, great, you're watching it live. Um, those who are watching it within the next 24 hours, I guess you're watching it not live. And we've also got a few people um, who are probably going to be watching this when it eventually gets to YouTube. So hello to you as well. Uh, before we start, it's great to see some uh, familiar names and people joining and waving. Wave back to all of you. Um, thank you so much for uh, for joining us. Um, today, our guest is going to be uh, James Barry from PCAR Market. Um, and James is going to be with us uh, in a matter of uh, seconds, so uh, we'll be able to chat with him. So whilst we're doing that, what I'd ask you to do is in the little comment section on the bottom, would you be so kind as to uh, click the dots and type in questions you'd like to know uh, from James. Now, bear in mind, he is the senior vice president of PCAR Market, the marketplace only for Porsches. If you have any questions regarding markets, regarding the actual uh, selling of the vehicles, any sort of Porsche questions, uh, it'll be fantastic to hear from you regarding that. So I see that PCAR Market have joined, which hopefully means James is at the other end of the video. I'll just wait for him to uh, ask to go live. Let's see if I can do it for him. Or perhaps not. Aha, I can do. There we go. So I've added him now. So in a matter of seconds. Oh, by the way, I forgot to add. Have your drink ready. I've got my cider. So fingers crossed. A very Hello. warm welcome. How are you doing, James? Good afternoon or good evening to you. How are you today? Very well. How about yourself? Not too bad. Not too bad. I'm uh, enjoying the home time as much as I'm getting now. So... Uh, I can't fight it. I may as well enjoy it as best as I can. How about yourself? What's uh, business been like today? Uh, you know, same as every day. It's always interesting. <laughs> Quality. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, so let's start with a little bit of history about yourself first. I mean, some of the patrons already watching have an idea about PCAR Market. Um, you've, you've done an incredible job, you and the rest of the team, David, Sam, uh, Adam as well. Um, but tell us... How come you got found yourself with Porsches, of all brands? Well, that's kind of a natural thing, you know. Uh, same reason you like Porsches and probably everyone else who's watching. Um, you know, we didn't wake up and say, let's start a business because we thought it would be profitable. We all love Porsches. Everyone here owns a Porsche, drives a Porsche, and just has deep-rooted um, lineage to the mark. So um, that's how we found ourselves being a Porsche-centric um, uh, platform. Mm-hmm. And yourself personally, how did you find yourself falling in love with the, the Stuttgart mark? Well, I'm, I'm one of those that it, it happened from a very early age. You know, I, I loved cars since I was very, very young. Uh, just in my blood, can't help it. I didn't choose it. Um, you know, all the kids were into sports when I was a kid. I was just sitting out looking at cars and detailing, washing them, reading magazines. Just a, a big lover of cars. And uh, I, I guess it started with the Porsche specifically when I was around 10. I had a neighbor that had a Irish Green 911T. Um, he may be he may be watching, and uh, his dad had a 356 4 cam and uh, some other cool cars, and uh, you know that was like my first real ride in one. And and I learned you know I went to the Hershey swap meet in the 90s and got to see you know hundreds of them in one shot, and uh, you know that was it. It was all downhill from there. So. <laughs> and then your journey it's it's brilliant because you've you've been in the automotive industry pretty much all your life after finishing yes. high school or even during high school is that right even during yes yeah yeah okay so, yeah. so where did it start from and, and where did you what was the journey that well, you took it was to mainly I, I did i did anything i could to be exposed to cars you know so i uh you know, I, I love Porsches. I, I love Mercedes and BMWs as well, Audis. And I, I like a lot of different cars, but, you know, Porsche is like the main one, you know. Um, uh, it's the mark I'm most deeply involved with. I'm not a member of, like, the Lexus Club or anything like that, um, <laughs> although I appreciate it. So, so I just did everything I could to get myself exposed to those types of cars. So everything, so as a young kid when I was 11, 12, it started with the detailing, you know. Um, just went around, put business cards on 
the cars I liked and people would call me, I would detail them. And, uh, and then it got into the buying and selling and I did that all through college and, uh, and it took me to this, to this point. So during college, you had a side gig in buying and selling cars as well. Yeah. yeah. Did you work for a Yeah, that was, when I was a little, well, I, I worked for myself when I graduated college. Um, I did have a brief time with uh, Audi Porsche um, down in Florida. And, um, and then I partnered with a, a nice gentleman who uh, we still do a lot of business and with dear friends today that was on the Mercedes franchise. But we did a lot of used Porsches, you know, um, we had like a satellite store. And uh, he and I, you know, I had a wholesale company with him. He owned big, big companies. And, um, you know, we just bought and sold a lot of Porsches. You know, we were actually very close to Champion. We did a lot of business there. So, oh, okay. uh, you know, I got to see all their cool cars that they built, you know, uh, at the time, like it was the 997s were just coming out. So they had like the F77 car they built and just, you know, all the, all the nice wheels they made, cars they had for their racing team. So it was, it was very enjoyable being in Florida with, with, with the Porsches. Very, very big Porsche culture down there. It's interesting because I've come from a, an automotive background as well. Uh, I used to sell cars uh, too, uh, and German Marks, Mercedes, and, and, and others. Do you find, I don't know if it's similar in the US, in the UK, those front of house don't really, aren't really proper car people. They just seem to like selling. Is it a similar sort of thing you find in the States with car sales execs? Yeah, that, that's, that's kind of why we're doing the business different than most. Um, you know, e even in our dealer career, you know, we, you, you can't, you can't have an operation that sells 300 cars a month and everyone's a car enthusiast. Mm -hmm. So the problem is when you're selling a brand that requires that technical knowledge and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not a mechanic or anything, but you know, understanding certain things about the cars, like, you know, if you see a 996 on sale at a, um, like say a BMW dealership, maybe they took it on trade and you call them up and ask them if the IMS was done, they say, what's an IMS? So, <laughs> you know. That, that, that kind of leads us into this the peak car market where, you know, people who buy these cars, they need a place to deal with sellers and buyers and a community of people who understand the mark because it takes an understanding of the mark to sell the mark, you know, and that's, that's the problem. It's not just transportation. I hear you. Um, you know, you could tell it's definitely a passion, passion element mm -hmm. to it. You know, you wouldn't choose a single brand uh, as such if it wasn't for a certain so something igniting that passion um yes. so let's actually move over to, to, to p car market itself so how did it start i know you've been the, the page the p car market instagram page started tail end of 2018 and yep. i remember started conversing i think with sam and adam um yeah. from from your team uh later after that's why i managed to bag myself a p car market t-shirt there you go um, we gotta get you the hat now we just got the hats Oh man, I'll be matching. I'll, I'll, I'll look. Uh, you need to get me on payroll then, man. Um, yeah. So, so, so tell us, uh, you know, the the start of it. What happened? How did it happen? Who had what conversations? The, the funny thing is, uh, you know, you can almost say I don't know. It was almost meant to be, perfect storm type of thing. Um, you know, I had relocated back to New York. I got married up here, and uh, you know, still was was heavily into the wholesale end of the industry. Uh, but buying and selling cars that I liked and just kind of like playing with them and, and selling them on special you know, channels like eBay and, and you know, bring a trailer, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, I met uh, David, who's the CEO of my partner, um, who's, you know, through the Porsche Club, actually. Uh, you know, I, I never met him before. And I heard he was just an avid lover of cars, especially Porsche. He's um, big into the history. You know, that's not my forte, but he's, he's very big into the racing history and the memorabilia. He's a sign and, mem and uh, memorabilia collector as well, which I am not. Um, and I heard he had some pretty spectacular Porsches, some that I've never even seen in the flesh before, like, you know, cars that you in Europe have, but we don't have here. Um, and we connected. So we kind of shared the hobby and the passion together. Um, we bought a lot of cool cars over the years and sold them in, in the building where he houses his collection as more of like a, as a hobby and slash business. Mm -hmm. um, we restored a lot of cars together. We, you know, we built some really cool hot rods um, because we do like to drive too, as well as collect. And uh, that was when the bell went off, maybe three years into our relationship. Um, you know, he said, you know, we should really do something global, um, you know, where, where Porsche buyers and sellers come together. 
and just, you know, trade and sell and collect this, this brand and, and, and do it in one platform. And he says, you know, would you be interested in doing this with me? I said, of course. So we spent maybe a year and a half developing it, the technology, mapping out how it was going to work, what the best type of model would be. And that would be uh, the, short, the short version of it. <laughs> that's how it happened. But, you know, we're surrounded by just exceptional people. Everybody here is uh, not here for a paycheck. They're here because they love what they're doing. You know, everyone loves what they're doing. They love the cars, and everyone has just deep enthusiasm for it. You, you can tell that. I mean, I, I see Adam's uh, Instagram a lot. Um, I think he's watching as yes. well, bless him. And, uh, and he just seems to be having a laugh all the time. That and also spending a lot of time with his, his pug. Um, so yes. it, it flips between Porsches and pugs with him. But, you know, everyone's yeah, having a good time. Epitome. He's the epitome of, of what you want to capture. I mean, you know, his, he made it his goal to have a Porsche within the first year of, uh, of working here. And um, he, he exceeded that far earlier. Um, but um, it, it's just when it's in your blood, it's in your blood. I hear you, man. I completely agree. Yeah. Um, so what drove the decision to make it primarily an, an auction site? Well, one of the frustrations that, you know, a lot of the viewers may be able to share is you find a car that you really like, but you can't buy it for a number of reasons. You know, maybe it's, it's far away and you can't get the description you need. Maybe the price is just way out of line. Um, you know, a number of different things. So the, the, the biggest elephant in the room when you're buying a car is the price. It, you know, it distracts from the whole experience of enjoying the process, of, of finding out the facts you really need to find out about the car because it's all about would you take this? No, I won't. You know, I'll keep it. And that whole rigmarole. So what it does is the auction, the price is not even discussion. You know, it's just out there. People are bidding what they feel the car is worth. And, and the community, you know, 90% of the time, they're not really commenting about the price. It's more about relevant information on the car, which is really what is, is the essence of it. And the price is going to be what it is. The car is going to get to the market. Um, and, and then the seller has to decide, you know, if they really want to part with the car at that point. You know what I mean? Because then there's no argument about the price. Okay. So that's really it. And, 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 and then we have the deal tank, which, you know, because sometimes... You know, not everything sells in an auction, as you know, you know, in, in history, you can't have everything sell in an auction. So the deal tank is a really, really big success for us because it captures people who maybe weren't in the market last week when, 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 they, when that car ended and it didn't sell. Um, and that's, that's a really, really unique model, too, because you still have the social interactive element of it uh, where people can comment. You can see the auction history. You can still see the write up and all the photos. Uh, and people really like that part of our site. That's awesome. I suppose, you know, during the, and, and to F, uh, you know, echo what you were saying, during the sales experience or sales process, the, the stumbling block always tends to be when it comes to negotiation, objection handling, and the price, you know, those, those that kind of area. Uh, it, at least I remember how uh, some customers of mine tended to go, they tended to change their tack when it came to, you know, talking about prices and whatnot, which was always a, a bit of a struggle. But like you say, auction, it's easy. You say how much you, you want to pay for it, and someone may bid you over. Someone You may not. You may get it. You may not. That's right. Do you, do you think there's also an element of um, adventure when it comes to auctions? That it you certainly may is. Have because into? In, in, in our sales career, you know, you can use a lot of logic for things. But auctions, it's so random. You know, it's just you wake up in the morning and you say, what's going to happen today? You know, it's really, really interesting. So, um, yes, it's definitely suspenseful. Um, and, and it's interesting to watch, you know, because it also gives the people the confidence to go out and make an offer on something that they maybe wouldn't pick up a phone and do. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of cars advertised at a number and sell at a lower number at the auction. And then you quickly find out, because we actually like to talk to a lot of the buyers. We had a um, a great opportunity of meeting them when we travel to places like, you know, Amelia Island and, and Monterey and all the works reunions and stuff that we do. And they'll admit this stuff to us. They'll say, uh, wow, you know, it's funny. I, I tried to buy that car and I threw the bid thinking I wasn't going to get it and I got it. Um, so it's, it's non-confrontational, right? You know, um, no one's going to judge you for what you bid. You bid and that's it. <laughs> so do the sellers have as much fun? I mean, obviously, the, the bonus at the end is they get money, but at the same time... Yeah, they... especially, especially the private owners. You know, I'll, I'll mention the one we sold this week was a very special car, the Cobalt, uh, Zenith Blue, excuse me, 993. Um, yes. he, he was, your, he was the, the, the type of person you want to buy a car from. The man loved his car, 
and he, you know, he wanted to see it go to a good home. And if anyone was following that auction, you could see it in the comments. It comes to life, you know, um, what a passionate person he was. So the sellers have fun um, in, in that regard, you know, big time, because then they see, you know, a, a global audience of people appreciating their car. It's almost like pulling into a car show and getting a lot of praise or winning a trophy. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it, it seems that it's a positive for everyone involved. Um, so you also on the page, because I, I spend a bit of time looking at your, uh, looking on the uh, P-Car Market uh, page, uh, quite a lot, actually, because there's a lot of cars that I think, Mm, that'd be quite nice to have alongside my 996 but i happen to find that you also have a section for new cars or, or nearly new you know we we were we, that was actually a test pilot so you must be following pretty closely we um we do a lot of uh of sales for you know porsche franchises when they get a lot of the older cars um we sold quite a few hot rods for some franchise stores quite a few new speedsters um, I think we, we've done pretty well with the speedsters and we're a pretty good source for the uh, market if you're looking to, to dial in a price on those cars right now. Um, so we were, we were um, piloting something that we, we launched just as a test during the, um, the COVID period where people were mm -hmm. home and the dealerships were forced to close where, uh, you know, they, it's not an auction. They can just put up their cool cars, kind of like a fun mm -hmm. thing, you know, and feature them and then have a link to their inventory. And yep. um, it, it's something that will, will come down the pike uh, very, very soon once all the, all the testing is done and everything like that. But uh, yes. That's awesome. It's, it's great to see that you're kind of having a, uh, an effect and also trying to bring in other, other markets as well within this. So uh, well done. Thank um, you. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you and, and have your opinion, because A, I think, you know, what you folks are doing is incredible and you really are pushing the envelope with the auction site focusing squarely on Porsche. The, and I've tried to steer away from the subject of this because we're affected by it anyway. But mm -hmm. the, the pandemic that we're experiencing at the moment, um, have you noticed and what have you seen uh, being so close to the market? What has changed and what's different? If anything, well, so what's, what's, what's interesting is, is that every segment of the market is going to react differently. Um, mm -hmm. And I can tell you that um, in the specialty automotive market, whether it be, you know, any kind of collector car, enthusiast car, not just Porsche, you know, because I do follow, like I said, we're, we're all enthusiasts of Mercedes and BMWs and Ferraris and everything. So we, we, we are pretty plugged in. You know, we attend all the big auctions. You know, we were just at Amelia Island. That was the last time I really left my house for <laughs> uh, <laughs> all of this. Um, so, um, what we're finding right now is that uh, not a lot's changed in that market. Um, you know, from a lot of our, our colleagues in like generic new and used car sales, uh, just from not lack of being able to open their doors, they're suffering pretty greatly. And that's, that's going to be an interesting thing to see what happens when those stores reopen. But we're seeing, you know, people are not afraid to buy, you know, cars mainly because they, they are assets, you know, it's a supply demand thing. If you have something that. You can't get anywhere else, you know, even if things did get, you know, go down, there's only a limit to how far it will go down. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, have you noticed any difference in, in values? Are people bringing their values down? Is the market forcing that now? Or, you, you would you think know? that. I mean, we, we've had a, a fraction, you know, just a couple of people who maybe had to liquidate something to, you know, cover a stock position or something like that. But, but no, you know, and one of the main things, too, is, you know, the, the Porsche is already, you know, corrected you know uh, prior to this you know there was a big correction in the market to where you know th there was opportunity to buy some cars that could maybe be some good future long-term investments um if this had happened two years ago you know when the prices were a lot higher um there may be a different conversation we're having right now but you know a lot of the cars that we're looking at you know they're they're at pretty attractive prices especially when you compare what they sold for and when and, and people acquired them for in public forums you know just two to three years ago, you know, and even earlier than that. Yeah, the, the climb from like 2011 and 12 was, was, was mad. You see 964s, one moment, I, I'm talking in, in Sterling, one moment they're about 10 to 15,000 pounds. And five years later, we're talking about 50, 60,000 pound Carrera twos. And you're thinking, mm -hmm. this, is, this is madness, you know, why, how it's literally gone from there to there so, so quickly. Yeah. Um, but like you say, the last year, 993s, they seem to sort of 
dip a little bit. I noticed uh, in values. Uh, um, yeah, it's funny. I, I mean, you know, when you talk to a lot of sellers, you know, a lot of them are, are you know, it, it, it's hard for them to accept that. It takes a while for the sellers to catch up to the market is really what we see, right? So, so just to give you an example, like last year, okay, one of the most common cars we were not able to put on the site because of reserve requests were 930 turbos. And now this year we're selling a boatload of them because the sellers have caught up to the market. You know, uh, they, they went down, but the sellers still thought they were worth 150 to $200,000 for a driver. <laughs> and now that you could buy them for seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 in the U.S., you know, not, not a you know, concourse car, but, you know, the people are actually coming to terms with it and they're selling them. And we're selling quite a bit of them. And you know what? It's a great value there. Um, and I think the sellers also realize when you think about it in perspective of what any other 1987 vehicle is worth in today's market, that's still a lot of money, even though it's down from what it was. Of still course. a lot of money. Of yeah. course. Yeah. There's some of us that still remember how cheap you could get into a, a 930 Turbo like 10 years ago. And now you're thinking, what have I done? Why did I, not, why did I make that decision or not make that that's decision right. in the first place? Um, so... With regards to the stock as well that you cover, I'm going backwards a little bit before I hit the Q&A with everyone and, and their, uh, their questions. Um, with your, the, the cars that you actually do sell, there's a real mixture. You know, you don't just have your concourse cars. You've got some hot rods in there thrown into it. I think the, one of the first cars that you got to sell was, was it STR, which Magnus Walker car? STR002? Zero three? And did that uh, get zero sold? Two. To, zero two, yeah, that was it. Yeah. And did it get sold to someone in the UK as well? It's by you. It's by you. Yeah. Yes. A very, yeah. very nice uh, gentleman. I actually got to speak to him. Big enthusiast. Big enthusiast. Yeah. Yep. I managed to see that car last year for the first time in the flesh. At, uh, we, we have this place called Bista Heritage, and it was there, and it just looked glorious. And, and I remember when you were advertising, you were selling it. But it, that caught my eye as well, because it's not necessarily your concourse, pristine, low mile, immaculate, mm -hmm. you know, never driven in, in, in outside of, of the sun, in the sun, outside of the sun or something like that. Um, you sell everything or you, you're willing to auction everything. Yeah. You know, it, you know, it has to be interesting. It has to obviously be a, you know, a Porsche or something, you know, in, in that realm. Um, but the market is, is huge and demand, I should say, is huge. For, for anything that is um, interesting. So what I mean by that is, you know, if you have a neglected high mile car, um, you know, if it was sold at like no reserve or like as a project, that's even interesting. But when you have a car that's not concourse, but it's sorted and, and you know, maybe a little bespoke and some modifications and stuff like that, the market for that is, is huge because um, one of the biggest complaints you would get uh, when I used to be in retail was, you know, I buy this concourse car and if I drive it, I'm going to lose so much value. So people really like a car that they can drive and not get, you know, assaulted when they go to sell it because they put too many miles on it. So, you know, if you have a 993 or a 964 with 80,000 miles, but the motor's been done and, you know, all the, all the, 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 the laundry list of, of items that should be tended to were tended to, um, there's a huge market for that. Huge. In fact, we have a uh, a few really cool 993s on the site right now that aren't high mileage, but they're certainly not, you know, baby mileage. And um, they're getting a lot of activity just in the first couple of hours of them being launched, um, which is, you know, usually opposite. Usually you see the, the, a lot of the bids coming in towards the end. You know, we had a car went up and it went up to like $30,000 in the first couple of hours and it still has six days to go. Oh, so, gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and ironically, it was a car that was sold on Pecan Market. And uh, the gentleman spent a ton of money sorting it out, and he put, you know, some cool wheels. He did the European uh, spec suspension on it, uh, exhaust, and and the car is just killer. And um, he's just parting with it now. He's he's a little tall, let's be honest, and he just can't get in that car. He's gonna get a, he's gonna get himself a convertible or a target to drive. So, <laughs> oh bless yeah. him. That that's that's a horrible way to go, especially if you spend that kind of money sorting a car out. But. But fair enough. Yeah, that's uh, it's it's great. It's so welcoming as well to other vehicles. So uh, so very well done with it. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to there's let me see a few questions that have come up. Ah, okay, here we go. So we've got a few questions about what's behind you now. You're currently, oh. am I guessing right? You're at CCS Motors. Is that the same place? Or? Well, we have our headquarters here. This is where we house our collection, and then we have our office on the other part of the building. 
Um, yeah. So okay. b- behind me is a, um, a car that actually does get driven, but it is a concourse car. It's, the, it's, a, it's an aquamarine, which is probably one of the nicest colors I've seen in person on the 356. Um, it's a Speedster, it's a 58 Speedster. Mm-hmm. And uh, to my right, is uh, something very interesting. We've done a few posts on this car. It's, it's the actual uh, training chassis from Hoffman Motors. Because as I said, uh, the CEO of the company is, a, is an avid historian. So um, he's, he's very, very big into the history of Porsche and how it came to this country, which obviously, you know, I'm, I'm into that part of it as well. Um, the, uh, the irony is uh, that Max Hoffman, who was responsible for bringing these cars here, um, his, his estate happens to be three miles from here. We never knew that until about five years ago. And um, we, wow. we, acquired, yeah, we acquired a lot of cool stuff from uh, his era with Porsche and other marks, you know, everything from, you know, uh, posters and things from the showroom to drawings of the 507 before it was produced. And uh, we had the chance to get this, which was the actual training car that they brought over to teach the, uh, the technicians how to work on Porsches, everything from mechanical to body repair and welding. And it's actually drives. It starts up and drives. It's been driven. We've taken it around the block. It's a functioning, uh, it's a functioning art piece. Uh, and, and what's the, the final idea with it? What, what, what's gonna, what are you going to do with it at the end? It's here on display, um, you know, because we, we do go to a lot of events. We take it around for people to see. We get a lot of visitors. You know, we welcome everybody who is, is plugged in to us and, and, and likes what we're doing. We always welcome them to make an appointment, stop by. You know, we're not hiding the stuff here. We, we love talking about it and sharing the, the passion we have with other people. Um, we do a, an enormous amount of cars and coffees here. And when I say enormous, not, a, not amounts of cars, but we get enormous turnout, that's what I meant to say. Um, we'll do a cars and coffee here. We'll get three, 400 cars, and we have to shut down the, uh, the street before the, the police come. Um, <laughs> and, and we do it right. We get cool food trucks to come in, and, and, and local coffee roasters come and supply the, uh, the coffee for everyone, and we get... You know, a lot of different cars here, uh, but the Porsches usually outnumber everything else. Um, so we do have, we always do share uh, that with everyone, and we do a lot of PCA events here as well with the local club. That's good. So you, you really do kind of want to, not kind of, you do play a real big part within the community as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. Out of curiosity then, because you, you've kind of wet my appetite a little bit with these two. Do you have any other cars on this floor that we can't see? We do, but I have this camera set up. It's like tied to a uh, to a podium. Um, but I, I don't think we'd ever be opposed to scheduling another one where I can, uh, you know, I can walk around and go through some of the cars with you. I, I'm That'd sure be very cool. Be happy to do that. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. I, I, I guessed as much. I saw someone literally come out of camera shot as we started. So uh, um, don't worry. It's all good. But uh, it looks an amazing space anyway. So, you know. Very cool. We have I had a few questions. Actually, in I have I have I have an assistant now. Uh, we could turn the camera if you want. Oh, go on! Oh, go on. What a treat! I, I was left alone. See, I'm... <laughs> okay. Show the half and lift the shadows here. How do you feel this? I don't know. Just touch it. You may have to bring the entire platform it was on with you, so it's the most awkward camera. Um, gimbal. Look at that. That is awesome. It's that is beautiful. A lot of work's gone into that. Okay. So with this area of the business, not only do you have your uh, 356 and the, um, the the frame as well. Uh, did I spy an F40? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you did. I'm so sorry. I know this is a Porsche page, but you know what? That's okay. That's a cool car. I, I told you we love we love all European cars. Um, oh, we have gorgeous. a lot of interesting eye candy here. Is that an RS60 under the cover? Why well, good. Take it off. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, see, we're getting an all. Ex- uh, oh, that is stunning. This was the actual car that Sterling Moss drove, um, who obviously just passed away recently. Yeah. Oh my God! Uh, this is this is the. Is that the one he had the accident in? 
Um, I don't believe he had an accident. And this is the one where the transmission broke right before he got to the finish line. Oh, the target Florio. Yes, exactly. Yeah. On the last lap. This is, this is a very, very, uh, very, very important piece of Porsche history, racing history here. I remember he bought, he actually, no, the one he crashed in uh, during uh, a race in 2011 was one that he bought to make it look like this particular one. But this particular one was the, the Targa Florio one. That's incredible. Yeah, he actually made a replica of this very car because yeah. he owned it, but it later left his hands. He couldn't get it back. And he, had a, he has a replica uh, somewhere in his collection of this exact car. But okay. this is the real one. That is beautiful. You've got GT996, GT3 there. You've got the F40 there. Oh, do you know, it's beautiful. I, the thing I love about the F40, and I've seen a couple of them in, in, in real life, I was fortunate where I grew up. It was quite an affluent area. So you always used to see a few of these and F50s and, uh, and Enzos driving around. And I love the fact you can still see the carbon weave if yes. you look close enough with the paint because it's such yep. a thin layer of paint. It's, it's glorious. Yes, it's, it's an amazing car. But the 996, actually, because you and I were talking about 996s yesterday, we had a, yes. um, a 996 GT3 here that we loved so much that we, uh, we had to get this. So we imported this from Europe. It came from uh, France, I believe this car came from. Interesting. And um, it's, it's, it's just unbelievable. And, you know, it, it was very hard to find the blue wheels. There's not a lot of them with the blue wheels. I, I believe only 20% of them were built that way. Yeah. Stunning car. Yeah, it's a great yeah, piece. This is just this is the this is the ultimate you know, one of the ultimate water cooled cars you could ever get. I feel. <laughs> so, the you didn't get the RS in the US. You got the GT3, but not the RS, right? It, it, yeah, you can't get the RS. That was that was a tough task. That took eight months to get that car. We had we paid for it. You couldn't see it for eight months. That's how long that took to get federalized. Stressful. Oh, that is beautiful. Nine six five. Yeah, nine six four. This is a three point eight RS. Oh, it's an um, RS. Sorry, it's cool. I didn't realize. Yeah, there's only fifty five of these in the world. Three eight. It's a three point eight. Three point eight. Glorious. Great. Uh, did they come in? Brother. Is that? Oh, here we go. Uh, uh, Carrera RS. It's gorgeous in the proper yeah. color as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Ruby stone. Ruby stone. Maritime blue. Those are the two top colors on that car. They are. Yeah. The lovely and then the 73, the 73 uh, tangerine. And these are, I take it, just pieces for yourself, your collection, the collection. As this, such. These are in the collection. They, they all get driven. They get shown. Um, they're here, you know, on display for people to come and see. But uh, in fact, now more than ever, they're being driven because uh, social distancing. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it's a good way of doing it, isn't it? Yeah. So this is where we're, we're going to be doing uh, like a podcast called Pico Market Live. Um, just to answer questions. You know, a lot of people call us with the same questions. So we're going to actually get on a publicly uh, a public forum and, you know, discuss some of the things that people want to talk about uh, buying cars at auctions and, and the things involved and the do's and don'ts and so on and so forth. So uh, it's a good idea, actually. Um, it, you're yeah. right. There's, uh, out of curiosity, what is like the most common question you get asked then? That's an interesting one. Well, it's usually nothing interesting, just logistical things. You know, people like to know, uh, you know, uh, what happens. Uh, it's mainly from like the sellers, right? You know, uh, you know, how do I handle the transaction, finalize the transaction? But in terms of like, you know, listing the cars and bidding, um, the most common question you get from people is about like inspections and stuff, you know, um, which we love when people ask that because we always tell them if you want to do an inspection, you, you know, do it before you bid on a car. Um, that's, that's very important. And, um, you know, just logistical things like that. Yeah, I get you. Yeah, I get you. Um, the, one of the questions we had, and it's quite an interesting one, although you can sell globally, uh, it was, it's not even a question, it's a statement. It's from right. a gentleman called David from Workshop 77. Uh, and he says, I'd love to have PCAR Market in the UK. I think they do a bloody good job. Um, so you've got a fan, for one. And second... Thank you. When are we going to see a P car market based in the UK, or when are we going to see cars flogged from in the UK as well? Well, he, he, we we all, we already are global. You know what, what's happened is you know, obviously our, our primary audience is in in North America, right? US, Canada, but we've sold cars all over the globe, um, and we've even sold cars that weren't located in the US. Um, there was a second okay. Magnus Walker car. Um, uh, it was a 930 Turbo 
that was in Australia. Australia, yes. Paddington yeah, Outdoor. And I, yeah, and I ironically, uh, that car sold to a gentleman in Hawaii, who ironically I spoke to this morning because he, uh, he bought a Cayenne GTS on our site um, two weeks ago. And uh, as a result of the COVID, um, having trouble getting the title from the seller because uh, the DMVs are closed. So these are the kind of things we're dealing with right now with, with the, uh, you know, the, the pandemic that's going on. Um, and we, we had a talk and it took him a very long time to get that car, but he got it. It's safe and sound. He said it's uh, spectacular. Um, so, so we're there. Uh, you know, if someone listed a car in the UK, we, we would be happy to list it. Um, you know, obviously the more bespoke and unique the car is, the more attention it's going to get globally. Um, but we, uh, you know, we are a global company and, and we, we take consignments from anywhere and, and everywhere, as long as they meet the criteria, obviously, and, and the sellers are upstanding. Of course, of course. Uh, and when you say criteria, the, what is the criteria? Make, so we know. We well, mainly, sure. mainly disclosure. You know, um, the big reason this works is classifieds are vague. You know, so you want to you wanna have a listing where people's objections and questions are met without really having to ask much more. Mm -hmm. um, and you'd be surprised, uh, and it's odd to our big disappointment when we get a car that we can't put on because we just cannot get what we need from the seller. You know, or, or you know, we, we find that they're evading certain questions and maybe hiding something, you know. There's, it's always buyer beware, but we do everything we can to make sure we're not putting up a problem for somebody. Of course, because I suppose uh, in the same time, if people get wind that you're stocking cars that are falling below expectation, it's going to mm -hmm. have an adverse effect on you. Yes, absolutely. Even, and, and even that's though... Why we, we, yeah, we rely on the community to let us know as well. You know, if someone saw a car... Um, if someone had dealings with a seller, um, you know, we, we like that people aren't shy with the comments, you know, uh, we rely on that, you know, we appreciate it. Okay. Uh, makes sense. Makes perfect sense. Um, okay. So we have a few more questions. I think there was one who was asking for a value on his car <laughs> or a car. Uh, <laughs> Tell I, to I, submit you it. Know, <laughs> I kind of almost expected this to happen, but it's very, very brief. It's a guy called AG Porsche and he says, what's the average price for a 993 C4S? Uh, Aventure in Green, 1996, 40K miles. Sounds like a nice car. Uh, here in the US, you know, a car like that could be anywhere from 75 to 100, you know? It really, it really all depends on, you know, it comes down to paperwork, it comes down to originality, it comes down mm. to service history. You know, one, one thing I will tell you with the air-cooled cars, Typically, when you throw money into a car, you don't get it back, right? We all know that, especially with modifications, unless it's, uh, you know, unless you put a, a Singer engine in a car or something. But, um, you know, when you have an air-cooled car and there's paperwork of, of, a, of a major engine service being done, you will see those cars sell at, at a good percentage higher than the ones that haven't. Hmm. Because people budget that in their mind. They know it has to be done. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and, and, and color plays a big role. Color plays a big role. I actually like Adventure in Green. We have a car on the site like that right now. And, uh, and, uh, and I know someone that has a newer car in that car, a color paint the sample, actually, a GT2 in that color. Oh, wow. That must be stunning. I'm not yeah, it's coming, it's coming back with a vengeance, that color. <laughs> <laughs> so Adventure in Green is going to be the next big thing. So. It's cool. It's, it's definitely cool. Yeah, it's a very cool color. So uh, going on that as well, what you're saying, would you say condition – is far more important than say mileage when it comes to cars it, in a lot of cases yeah because what if you had a car with 500 miles but there was rats living in it and uh it wasn't started for 20 years which i've seen those cars it's very sad very sad oh, uh, i saw a 993 turbo like that recently with 7,000 miles and the car is destroyed um so condition is is the main thing you know and then obviously the mileage is the next factor in that equation sure okay thank you very much we've got Oh, okay. We we had something extra. Ag Porsche said. Uh, Porsche said plus a full Expel wrap he's got on there as well, and he's given good said good advice. So what you've said, um, you know what I you know what I would like to say to him is you know if you go into the completed listings on our site, you could see exactly what I'm talking about in terms of the variation on prices on those cars. Um, you know because you'll you'll see some that sell into the six figures still um, if they're really right, and and then you'll see like we had. Um, a paint to sample one on there that you know if it was like you said condition wise perfect would have been a six figure car but i believe it sold for under 70 because it was repainted and there wasn't a lot of service history but you know it was honestly represented and somebody got a heck of a deal 
They'll put some money into that car and they're going to have a one-off car. Indeed, yeah. Well done. Okay, next we've got a few more questions that have come in and my screen is not... Okay, uh, another question from David from Workshop 77. Uh, we build cars and very few of them are stock. Is there still lots of love for hot rod 911s in the world in worldwide? He also mentioned UK. Um, so, hot rods are probably the biggest request we get from people who um, have at least one or two Porsches mm -hmm. um, and want something fun. You know, like what we were talking about earlier, where people have cars they don't want to put mileage on. Um, a lot of requests, and we, we fell into that category as well. We built, you know, a hot rod that we drive. We built a, a 3.4 twin plug, you know, really, really cool um, 915 gearbox, but, you know, just done to the nines. Um, I think a lot of people uh, want a hot rod. I don't see a lot of people buying them as their only Porsche, but certainly people who have yes. multiple Porsches, they, uh, I know this, that's on my list in the future, you know, um, and, and the nice part about them is you don't have any guilt about putting miles on them. They're not original cars anymore. And you can just drive them and, and really enjoy them. And what's nice is it's, it, they're all different. It's, 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 a, it's an interpretation of your, your vision, your dream, your character. And um, it's, it's like art. It's like viewing art. You know, I, that's my favorite thing to look at when I go to the shows now and, and stuff like that. I love seeing the hot rods. Uh, I completely agree, man. I'm, I'm in the same boat as you. There's something about a really well put together car that's an homage of different things but also you see a lot of the influence from the owner or the, yeah. the build themselves um, yeah. if you haven't had a chance you need to look at workshop 77's uh, uh work on their I, car yes I've, I've heard of them and um you know and I, what i'll say to that also to follow up i see rmc miami commented i know they have a lot of cool hot rods uh, they do stuff for this. um the uh the, the biggest problem i shouldn't say problem but the biggest area in, in the hot rod market that needs attention is is uh, educating the buyers because a lot of the buyers don't really know what they're buying they just know they want a cool car yes. um and that's why you see so much fluctuation disparity on on prices you know there's the to the normal person it's very hard to understand why two cars that look the same sell within two hundred thousand dollars of each other um, and it's, it's really important, you know, when you have these quality builds to give all the details so people know what they're buying, you know, um, because it's, <laughs> you can't pull out a book value on cars like that. I, uh, I drove, I was at RMC Miami in February and, uh, I managed to bag a drive in the 96 for Carrera four, uh, with a turbo on there. And it was the one of the best cars I've ever driven because it was so really? easy to drive. Yeah, it, it didn't feel like a, a hot rod per se, but the performance was definitely out there. This thing was, was, was silly quick, but it was so well put together and so easy to drive. Even um, Danny, who, who was next to me when we went for the drive, uh, you know, he was saying how, how simple a car it is to drive and it was a wonderful piece of kit. So I think I would spend more, I would spend better money on a vehicle that was well put together if it's a hot rod than something that's just all flash and no go because what's the point? I don't want an expensive mm -hmm. paper weight, you know? That's right. Well, and then it comes down to, you know, if you're a real air cool driver or if you're just, you know, because a lot of people do like the looks, you know, there's a lot of um, RS Tribute cars out there with, you know, really not a lot of, you know, mechanical things to brag about, which is okay, mm -hmm. you know, because some people just really love that look of the, you know, the, the RSR with the riveted fenders or even just like a 73 back date. Um, some people do buy them just for the looks. It's, it's clear. Um, but you know, when you, when you get into the purpose built driver's cars, that's when they can really start to cost some dollars. And that's where the disparity in the pricing comes that we find. And, and you have to, you know, the people who know what they're buying, they know what it costs to build and they know what to pay. You know, the people who don't, um, they're the ones that, you know, um, it, you know, they can just benefit from like reading articles and, and, and going on sites like ours and seeing sales and, and reading the descriptions of the cars. But it's really always good to have a, a person you could trust and, and get an opinion from someone if you're not a novice at it. True. It, you know, there's often so much information on the uh, adverts for your vehicles. Um, you know, a bit of due diligence, I would always say, if you know the company or the business that built the vehicle, if it wasn't a homebrew vehicle, contact them as well. It, it's always good to get um, direct information from them before you do a pre-purchase inspection. They're, they're not going to, you know, they're, they're probably going to tell you quite a fair bit as well. And Absolutely. I, I have yet to meet a builder 
who does not want to get on the phone and talk about the car he built, even if he's not the seller, because yeah. these, you have to have extreme love and passion to build these cars. Um, and so the, this is a, a very, they, they always have an attachment to these cars, even when they leave. So they're always willing to, to talk. It's going to be a very rare occurrence to find a builder that doesn't want to talk about a car they built. Uh, unless it's just, you know, not a credible person. <laughs> yeah, if it was actually three Porsches all molded into one, that's just the chassis. Right, right. Um, <laughs> no worries. We've got another question, I believe. Oh, this is quite, um, quite a good one. Simple one. Um, where are you located? And you already answered about can you visit because all you need to do is contact uh, the folks at PCAR Market and you can visit. But can they visit you? Yes, if you go on our website and hit contact us, it'll, it'll send a message to our help desk. Um, the answer is yes. Uh, to, if, when, I don't know, because right now in New York, uh, we're technically closed. I came in to do this because uh, I figured you want to see some of the cars here and, and I just wanted to be in the building. Uh, where there's good internet and stuff like that. But uh, we are closed to the public right now just because of New York law. Um, we're hoping to be back May 15th um, is whatever the buzz is right now. Um, and uh, obviously the whole team is still working remotely, uh, nonstop, probably even more because we don't have to commute anymore. Um, so uh, once all this stuff is passed, we are more than happy to have any visitors come uh, and, and, and meet us. We were planning to go to New York to the tail end of this year, but I don't know if that's going to happen now. But uh, when we do go to New York, I'll make sure I, um, I contact you folks to, to come Absolutely. over as well. Definitely. It'll be Absolutely. really good to see you guys. Um, I think there was – oh, there was a statement here from 111 Competition. And it's actually a statement to you, James. It's, James, you're so handsome. <laughs> I wish I knew who that was. <laughs> <laughs> hey this is the internet there's a lot of people peeping from from afar and uh just make sure you don't put your address there because you may find someone uh, knocking on your door uh we've also <laughs> got garage rodrigo and he says what do you think of the porsche 914 stroke six will it be a classic in the future uh, well, they, they already are. Um, mm. We actually used to own one. It was, it was a really remarkable car. Um, sold for quite a bit of money. Sold um, about two or three years ago. Um, we took it to a, um, um, a 70, it was the 70th anniversary sale for Porsche and, um, for RM Sotheby's. And um, okay. I think that car brought like $80,000 or something like that. They, they, the good examples will bring, you know, close to 100000 and even – you know, some of the ones that are like really cool driver grades will bring significant money. Um, I've even seen some regular 914s that were in concourse shape bring pretty impressive numbers in, in the past. I, I think we've come to a time where the unloved Porsches are kind of becoming loved again or being, being you know, having a lot more love thrown at them. You know, last year being the 50th anniversary, uh, there, seemed to, there seemed to be a lot more... Um, chatter about the 914 and the 914 stroke six so you know yeah and sometimes i find people overthink it you know if you just use some common sense you know one of the reasons porsches are, are so sought after is you can drive them you know a lot of, a lot of older cars um you can't really drive them you could look at them you could appreciate the history but you know you don't have to be a historian you could be a, a younger person who doesn't know anything about the history of porsche get behind the wheel and enjoy the experience so that's what helps just keep bringing the demand up and um they'll always be used for these cars here. Uh, thank Maybe you not that. this one next to me, but, <laughs> but certainly the one behind me. <laughs> to be fair, that's too clean. I, I struggle to want to be on that myself. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, we've got one last question, and it is from, I think their name is Skill Base, but with most of the vowels taken out. And they said, bring a trailer, sent out their data about increased traffic and bids. Does PCAR Market seem similar trends on their site? We have seen, um, yes, that's actually a very good question. Um, we're noticing that uh, since this pandemic, um, a huge increase in web traffic. Exact numbers I couldn't tell you uh, because we, you know, that's a whole different department and we don't even have the reports yet. April's not over. But um, mm. between all the, uh, the people being at home, the normal spring you know, increase that you would expect, um, we're doing... Uh, yeah, we're doing a, a Tanja is actually auctioning off some really cool pieces for charity on the site. I'm sure you're aware of that. Um, mm -hmm. We have this really cool virtual car show going on right now because we all wish we could be in a real car show. Um, and we're actually donating 
along with Haggerty, who partnered with us on this. Um, Two dollars oh, per car, every car that comes yes. in. So we hope thousands of cars get submitted um, because we want to raise money for uh, for COVID-19, feeding America is the charity uh, that it's going to. So um, all these comment, all these all these ingredients are definitely spiking traffic big time. Yes, and I got that same email that he was referencing last night as well. Oh, well, actually, yeah. a few nights ago. Uh, I remember seeing that as well. Um, I will make sure I advertise for the uh, um, uh, online um, car meet as such as well. So, you know, it's a, it's a great charity it's going to, and it's a lot of fun, you know, at the end of the day, what we're doing is yes. making sure that we want to bring communities together at this time. So very well done on that. And I'll do my best to advertise for you as well. We have one last, yeah. we, we have one last question and it's from KJ Singleton. And I, I think this is a, a, a good question. Why are cabs worth so much less than the coupe? And do they have the potential to increase in value? Because they, and I'm, I, I agree with him, they seem like good value now. And you could say the Targas are exactly the same boat. You see a G-body Targa, and that's a really good value for money buy into some air cool action. Yeah. Well, the Targas are a totally different story because the, the, um, the introduction of the 991, going back to that, that classic design, with the validated the older targas and all of a sudden you saw those cars wake up from the dead um they, like literally uh and, mm. and and a lot of them overseas I, I saw a lot of them leave the u.s and go over to europe um but the, the main reason that i would say is because it's the the 911 has had that classic silhouette and roof line and and same shape since its introduction in in the early 60s in our country it was 64 and um and that's the traditional portion to most people and, and, you know, I don't feel this way, but a lot of people feel, you know, they cut the roof off, they ruin the integrity of the car. Secondly, in racing, you know, the structure is, is just a lot more solid and, and, and more in, in, uh, true in a, in a coupe, or as you would say, yeah. we say coupe, but I like the way you say it better. Um, Sorry, so, I prefer the way you say it, to be fair, yeah. the coupe. So. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's, that's the main reason. However, there's exceptions to the rule. If you look behind me, a speedster you know, is a convertible, you know, any speedster, whether you look at a 356, you look at a uh, 89, you know, a 964, all the way up to the 997 and the new ones, that is not a cheap convertible by any means. But uh, what he's referencing is, you know, a 996 coupe versus a 997 cab. Traditionally, the coupe will sell for more money. Um, I, that, that would be my reason why, and I feel a lot of people's reason why the value. So if you want a cab, um, it's a great value. Yeah, okay. So maybe it'll stay as a great value option. So, uh, AG Porsche made a comment about that. And he said, if the top comes down, the price comes down. That may be right with cars, but with people, it's a different story. But there you go. <laughs> um, okay, so that's the end of the questions. Now, um, we've almost at the end of our, in, uh, of our time together. But like I promised you, that I've got these 14 questions that are, uh, have to be answered within two minutes. Now, these questions will probably not win you many friends. I'm joking. They're not that bad. Um, but you do have to take it in jest. Some of the questions you will be put on the spot. You don't have to elaborate. Just the first thing that comes into your mind, man. Okay? Okay. <laughs> okay. So I've got a timer in here. I've gone all no expense spared. I'm using a, an iPhone SE for the uh, two-minute timer here. So starting from now. Best Porsche ever. Ooh. 73 RS. Okay. Uh, dog or a cat? Dog. Good man. Uh, what would you drive if Porsche never made a car? Audi. Strong. Uh, last song you listened to whilst in your car? I'm sorry, last time I listened to what? Uh, what last song you listened to whilst driving in the car? Oh, I don't know. I'm on the phone all the time. I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. It was probably some music when you were on hold for something. Okay, there you yeah, go. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, best Porsche color? Etna blue. Oh, yeah. That's good. Uh, highway or canyon? Canyon. Good man. Porsche they never should have made. <laughs> This is the one that gets everyone. Yeah, I don't know. I like them all. I can't, I can't say. <laughs> oh, you're too nice, James. You're too nice. Okay, I'll let you go with that. Schumacher or Senna? Schumacher. Good 
Man. How could they improve the current 911? Less artificial sound and hydraulic steering. Okay, going back to basics, good. Um, favorite drink? Iced coffee. <laughs> Okay, a nice coffee man. Uh, favorite modified Porsche, other than any in your collection? I am a big fan of that new roof. Oh, yes, a stunning. Oh, 13 seconds left, sorry. Uh, Chinese food or Italian food? Italian. Good man. And lastly, your favorite film with a Porsche in it? Oh, the one with Charlie Sheen, I forgot the name of it. No Man's Land. No Man's Land, yes. yes. There we go. Literally just beat it. Well done. All right. Two minutes up. And I can't believe you got away with not answering the worst Porsche ever made. But yeah, don't worry, I that's fine. Thought into it. I, I really don't know. You know, because even, even <laughs> ones that you think were bad, you could do cool things to them and they make cool models. It's just, you know. I know. You should see some of the answers that we get, though. I had uh, uh, Lorena Esposito say the Panamera. Uh, we had, which I think is false because I love the Panamera. Yeah, they're cool. If, if you don't think of it as a sports car, you know, it's, it's, it's a great car. It's a great car. Exactly. But you if know, you want to laugh, I'll say something that maybe will, will rub people the wrong way. But when it comes to a four-door car, I would actually prefer like an AMG or an M car to that car. Even though I love the Panamera dearly, um, I, I, I love AMG cars, you know. Uh. Yeah, AMG, they're, 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 they're kind of cool, I suppose. Uh, you know, I, as I said, I used to work for Mercedes, so uh, I have my opinions. I think the cars are cool. That's all I'll say. Yeah. But yes, perfect. Okay, um, James, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. I know Pleasure. that um, I didn't mean to take you away from home and bring you to work, but I'm glad you came to work anyway, so well done. Um, and uh, I look forward to uh, speaking to you in the future and no doubt meet you face-to-face. Absolutely. We enjoy following your channel. We love your enthusiasm and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. All the best, my friend. Take care. Okay. Same to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. I uh, really appreciate it. It was some really good questions from you folks as well. I was really worried that it was going to turn into uh, how much do you think this car is going to be worth? How much car? How much do you think this car is going to be worth? Because I would be like, oh, God, I didn't want to make him work on this uh, interview. But I appreciate it. It was some really good questions. Um, a couple of bits and pieces to make you aware of. The next interview is actually going to be on Sunday in two days time. And we managed to bag an interview with a gentleman called Brock Keane. You may know him as uh, a gentleman with a 996 uh, C4S with a tent on the roof. Uh, he goes by the name of 996 Road Trip, and he will be our guest. It will be the same time as this interview. Uh, so 8 p.m. UK time, 3 p.m. Eastern time and midday uh, Pacific time. Uh, so we're going to have a really good time with him. I don't know if he's going to be doing it in his tent. It would be amazing if it is. Um, but the guy's a legend. If you see his page, just see the, the adventures he goes on. So it'd be really good to get an idea and understanding what he does. If you've been watching on here, thank you so much. Um, this will be up for 24 hours uh, and the link will be on my stories. And if you're watching this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, share and subscribe um, and uh, you'll be first to know when these videos come out. Thank you again for your support. You're all wonderful. Thank you, Casper. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everyone. Much love. Take care.